tonight we'll be in our sixth installment in the book of Ephesians. It's always in order to remind the saints that their salvation is holy or completely the work of the Lord. It's owing to Him. He's the one who has made all of the key determinations and purposes without which salvation would not be within our reach. The fact that God is the one that purposed it, planned it, implemented it, that's, that's the very thing that puts it within our reach. Because it's too high otherwise, see? You couldn't reach that high. No form of human wisdom could have devised a way back to God or figured out how to realize expiation from sin. How, how man, man couldn't come up with something. In fact, men have tried to come up and continue to try to come up with something that will, that will do this, whether they're heathen religions or whether even in the supposed Christian religion. There's people who are trying to, to devise plans that will work to mitigate the power of sin. They don't always call it sin. Sometimes they call it habits and that sort of thing. But see, they've never been successful in being able to eradicate the condition. The best thing they can do is try and teach people how to live with it. Maybe how to control it a little bit. Actually, even that's an imagination. You can't control something that's more powerful than you are. Amen. That's just the way it is. Now, the fact that a man can't resolve the dilemma caused by sin, that may seem very apparent to everybody, you know. But it can get away from you as in an instant. And you can begin thinking as though that wasn't the case. Not even realizing you're doing it. Because the adversary, he's on the, he's on the initiative to attack this whole idea. He, he's trying to try and convince you that you'll be better if you just take things into your own hand. And uh, eat the fruit, so to speak. Now, in any subject... However lawful it may appear, that has to do mainly with personal issues or interrelationships of men or something of that sort. When that kind of subject begins to dominate your thinking, maybe you stay awake at night thinking about it. Maybe you alter your life in some way to address it. But the thing that dominated in your mind, that thought is carrying you away from God. And you, we, have to learn to master the art of connecting our problems and difficulties with us and God. And again, you may be expert at this today and terrible in it tomorrow. That's why this kind of teaching we're going to touch on is tonight, that's why this kind of teaching is in the Scripture. Amen. It's foundational teaching. It's so, it's so weighty that you can't, like, have a fleeting attention, give fleeting attention to it and derive any benefit from it. It's, it's, that, kind of, it's that kind of thing. There's things in the world that are like that that you just can't look at them in a surface way. Like if you're a physician, you can't look at disease from a topographical viewpoint. Yeah. You've got to see it deeper than the most people see it. Mm -hmm. And this is much more so in the body of Christ, than the things pertaining to the kingdom. You'll notice 
that the apostles never are sidetracked to social, personal, or political issues. Mm -hmm. If ever they mention them, they just mention them and move on. They don't stay on them at all. Whenever they do mention these earthly relationships and earthly circumstances, they always set them in the context of God and, red and redemption. In fact, you'll not find anyone in Scripture, particularly after Christ, talking about God in disassociation from salvation. Amen. Now, people are prone to talk about God in association with other things than salvation, but that's not... The apostles don't do this at all. If, for instance, they mention some earthly relationship like husbands and wives, mm -hmm. they leave you thinking about Christ and the church. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, this is the way they are. Yeah. Amen. If they talk about masters and slaves, mm -hmm. they leave them both thinking about their association with God. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the text here where they do this. They talk about children being submissive to parents. They connect it with the promise of God. They talk about fathers raising the children. They mention it in the context of in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. See, it's always in connection with God. It's never in dissociation from him. No letters of the, of the scripture were ever written to a certain class of people or a certain body of people like uh, politicians or businessmen or so forth. No letters are written to an audience because they were businessmen or because they were politicians or because of a particular occupation they had. Peter, Paul didn't write a special epistle, for instance, to tent makers, and Peter didn't write a special epistle to fishermen. That's right. And Luke didn't write a special letter to doctors. Yeah. Amen. Yet Matthew didn't write a special epistle to tax collectors. This, this is not the way the scripture is written, but yet there is a phenomenal amount of religion that is on this basis. There's a particular thing for women, particular thing for men, particular thing for children, particular thing for married, particular thing for singles. Yeah. It all sounds really smart, but it's really dumb. Yeah, man, right. It completely missed the point. Because in the end, there isn't going to be any of these classes of people. Yeah. Not even male and female. Mm -hmm. They won't exist at all. Mm -hmm. So when the apostles teach, like Ephesians 1... The context they're dealing with is God's great salvation, which starts with all people on an equal, equal playing field. Mm -hmm. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. So it all starts out, everyone's, everyone's the same so far as the address of Scripture is concerned. Mm -hmm. Either they're addressing, it's addressing you as sinners, which is common, or as believers. Not as sin, sinful believers or believing sinners or some such thing as that. It's just important to notice. Words are delivered to such souls. Theophilus, as we understand it, had some kind of a position of authority, but when Luke wrote to him, he wrote the gospel, mm -hmm. which Jesus began to do and teach. And then he wrote this about the spread of the gospel of the church. He didn't write he didn't write about this is God's will for the people of your excellent category. <laughs> they always think within the context of the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, particularly the apostles. They're always that's the context they're thinking in. What God has done about the matter of sin, how thoroughly he has dealt with it, mm -hmm. and how effectively he's dealt with it. That's the, fr it's the framework of how they think and how they talk. Now, as I said, they can get away from you. It's possible that, let's say, for instance, that you are in a situation where you're 
your mate is dying before your eyes. It's stretched over, in my case, a year. Some people, that's all they can think about. That's it. They just sit and bemoan the fact that it's there. But what you've got to do, or a child, is some difficulty, you've got to take that situation and get within the circumference of God's great salvation and think the thing out before God in that context. And if you don't do that, it'll beat you down. And you'll not be able to handle it. Now let's look at our text tonight. See, the reason people don't do that is they don't think it's practical. Yeah. What's that got to do with us today, they say? Well, it has everything to do with us today. Amen. Verse 6 is what we're going to focus on. <coughs> to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted... It said he has made us accepted in the beloved. Amen. Amen. Now, of course, that is represented in a variety of ways in Scripture. <laughs> yes. I just wondered real quick before you moved on from that. What you've done there is just given us an exposition of Hebrews chapter 12 when we're encouraged to look unto Jesus. <laughs> Some think they have to kind of withdraw from everything. That's right. In order to really look at Jesus. And there are times like that yeah. you do. You, you have a very focused and concentrated time, but you don't have to turn away from Jesus while you're addressing all these other things. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. You bring it to him. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Before we look, that was a very fine introduction. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, very good. I, I look forward as much to the exposition of the text. I, I like the introductions too because <laughs> you're able to set, to set yeah. these things in the mm -hmm. context of salvation. Mm -hmm. And I think you was right on on this on this. Now, the whole purpose of Christ, of uh, salvation is is the oneness in Christ. That's it. So everything should be addressed. Uh, the uh, newness of Christ yeah. is a distinct. It's it. That's our kinship. A kinship with one another is our a new man. Our newness in Christ. So that's, that's right. what they're addressing. Amen. And everything else is actually irrelevant. Amen. It's transitory. See. In other words, anything that's transitory, that's here today, gone tomorrow, never is the focus of Scripture. I can't think of anything that was more, more devastating than the destruction of Jerusalem. There were some epistles written, most of them were written before that destruction took place. And yet it's not mentioned in any of them. Is that not a peculiar thing? Yes. And Jews were addressed. He didn't say, oh, it's just about here. It's just about coming. He didn't talk about because it's past. it is passing. Yeah. And eternal life is not tailored for what's passing. Amen. See, the redemption in Christ Jesus is not something that's passing. And it doesn't integrate with what's passing. What's passing has to get into that category. Yeah. You've got to think it out within the framework uh -huh. of the redemption. And all for to begin with, when you do do that, mm -hmm. it reduces the seeming significance of the thing you're dealing with. Right. right away, it, it shrinks in size. Mm -hmm. That's how big salvation is. But I was thinking of two of Jesus' healings in the context of what you just said, about viewing it from this broader yeah. perspective. The man who brought his boy... Yeah. to the disciples attending to bring it to Jesus and Jesus was up on the mountain. And when he appealed to Jesus, he said, I believe, help my unbelief. Now that was a big view. Yes, of right. This issue. Amen. The family was dominated by this person. That's the same thing with the Syrophoenician Gentile woman. Her own daughter was demon-possessed. Lord, even the dogs eat crumbs from the table. Now, that was a larger statement. Amen. Like, Heal my daughter. Heal my Amen. daughter. Amen. She was Amen. Amen. Yeah. And that, see, that is what touches the heart of the Lord. When you're wrapped up in his salvation, then you've, you've touched his heart. And that's what will move him, if anything does, to do something about the situation. And he, what he does may just make you equal to it. A person can also only be as stable as what they put their hope in. 
Yeah, that's so good. Like, for those who have these, the hope in the things of the world, they, they're vacillating. They're not Amen. stable. Yes. Whenever yeah. we put our hope in the things that surpass those mm. things of the earth, then we can pass through them steadfastly. Amen. Mm -hmm. See, most everyone knows the parable of the man building his house on the sand and man building his house on the rock. It's one thing to know the parable. It's another thing to inadvertently build on the sand. Yeah. Uh -huh. How do you do that? By only thinking of the present. Yeah. If the fellow that built his house on the sand would have thought about, well, it's, we're going to have some storms. Yeah. It's going to be some rain. He wouldn't have built there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, used to, he limited his thinking to the here and now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you can... Even though you're a believer in Christ, if you're not careful, you can build some part of your life on sand. Yeah, that's right. yeah. So that everything depends on things, think, things staying the way they are. Yeah. And that is, a, that is a, not a wise way to live, as you know. <clears throat> Amen. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Now, this again is this long sentence. <laughs> Some versions, the major versions, have a 3 through 12, at least 3 through 10. One sentence, they all interrelated, moving like from one compartment to another. You're in the same house, but you're moving from one room to another, and they're all linked together in this one single thought. The thought that he's continuing in here is that we are predestinated unto the adoption of children unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, that's verse 5. Verse 6, he's, he's going to build on that. Mm -hmm. This verse is an elaboration of why he chose us yeah. and why he predestinated us, chose us before the foundation of the world, predestinated us unto adoption. This is going to tell us why he did this. Yeah. He's not going to say, because he loved you so much, mm -hmm. even though from the inside, you can see that he did love you so much. So great love, shall we say. It's also going to say this, so you'll know that the doctrine of predestination is not a cold, lifeless doctrine. Amen. You've got to see it right. Not think of it as a cold and calculating doctrine that's divorced somehow from the hardcore life, facts of life. It's not designed to provoke controversy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God doesn't throw this out to make people start arguing <laughs> about whether God predestinates or not. That's right. So the information that is here give out safe to us means it's put into your care. Mm -hmm. The information put into your care now is intended to assist you in thinking about yourself and God and salvation and where you are, and this will help you to think the things through. Mm -hmm. Some people think enough about God to wonder whether they're pleasing or not, that, that their thoughts are aborted, they're left hanging in the air, wondering. Mm -hmm. But if you stay long enough and you connect the thoughts with the right things, mm -hmm. the right revelations like the one given in this text, you'll end up more confident and more sure. Because salvation is a confident matter, let me tell you. There's a reason why we've been forgiven. There's a reason why we've been justified and sanctified. And if that reason is not realized or perceived, either God's purpose failed or... Whoever said they're connected with God didn't tell the truth. I don't know any other, I don't know any other alternative to this. I, I'm beginning to see this with greater clarity than I ever have before. That Satan has successfully obscured the fact that there's a reason God saved us. Somehow it's never connected with a reason or a divine reason or some, yes. some way it's going, some place it's going, this salvation. So that's, that's why I want to deal briefly here with the words, to thee. Mm -hmm. He predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, to thee. Mm -hmm. See, 
for this purpose. The phrase to thee, some versions read, so we would. <laughs> that's, that's just kind of invigorating the thought. You mean God predestinated so we would? Da da da. Couldn't we do it without that? Well, apparently not. God chose us in Christ before the salvation of the world, so we would. In this verse. <laughs> Another version, the way version says, unto thee, that is in order to, well, this is the objective. The good news, God's word says, so that. He predestinated us into the adoption of children, but Jesus Christ to himself, so that. Another version says, so we. Another is so that we might be. You see, so this is this is this the end. This is this wouldn't have happened if he didn't predestinate us into adoption of, of children to himself. Amen. He did this so we would. Amen. So that's the language of purpose, see, Amen. of divine intention, and it saturates all the scripture. But I just want to draw attention to some of the statements in the book of Ephesians alone where he, he connects what God did with where it was going. We were predestinated unto adoption, the adoption of Chelsea, so that was the objective. Ephesians 1, 5. Yeah. Having predestinated us unto the praise of the glory of his grace. Being predestinated, verse 12 says, so that we should be. See, we are sealed with the spirit of promise until the redemption of the purchased possession as the resurrection of the dead. He created all things in Christ Jesus to the intent. See, we're going here. That now under principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known to by the church the manifold wisdom of God. That he would grant you to be strengthened with might by the spirit of the inner man that... Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith. <laughs> See where all of this is? God does things for a reason. If that reason doesn't materialize, how can you prove the thing that was intended to accomplish that took place? If this is why God did this, if this is why God did this and this doesn't happen, how do you know this did? That's all connected with Joseph's dream as a boy. <laughs> That's right. And Amen. The fulfillment of these mm -hmm. things when his brothers Amen. actually bowed to them. Amen. Bowed to him. And then his, his uh, exposition of the whole thing when he says, you didn't do this, God did. God That's did. Right. Amen. To bring about this great salvation. Yeah. This, is, it's, this is invigorating to think of God in this Amen. way. This is how God is. Mm -hmm. He does things for a purpose. Not in hope that the purpose might eventually maybe yeah. take place, yeah. but in order that it might in fact take place. Here's another one. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto, and this is the joint body, yeah. a perfect man. Mm -hmm. See, so there's an individual man that is made perfect. According to 2 Timothy 3.16, but the body of Christ as a whole is made perfect. Amen. So the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, someone said, well, we finally got unity. Praise God, we're united at last. Mm -hmm. Well, that unity is intended to end up mm -hmm. a perfect man. Mm -hmm. That which is good for the case use of edifying, that it may minister grace. Grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Walk as children of light, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. See? One more, doing service as to the Lord, but not unto man. So this is a, a way of divine reasoning. That's, that's just, just the book of Ephesians alone. It's all the way, all the way through Scripture like that. God does something in order to the realization of something else. This is why the ministry of the prophets is so <laughs> beneficial to us, because they're the ones 
that proclaim the sufferings of the of Christ and the glories that should follow. So that when they came to pass, mm -hmm. you could look back like Peter on the day That's of right. Pentecost and said, "This, this is, is that." that. Yeah. That's right. See, God's kingdom is driven by purpose, and that's the, this is what I gave you was the language of purpose. Mm -hmm. Some people think that the thing that happened, being predestinated and so forth, they forget what it leads to, and they think that's the, that thing that he did is the point, mm -hmm. rather than what it is intended to accomplish being the point. Mm -hmm. See, once you see this, you're dissatisfied with immaturity, mm -hmm. lack of growth in Christ, lack of discernment, Lack of personal knowledge, spiritual knowledge, uh, wisdom and spiritual understanding. You're discontent with it because God has worked so these things would in fact take place. Mm -hmm. So if they haven't taken place, mm -hmm. we've got something seriously wrong. Amen. My own perception is that what God really did has not been proclaimed. It's what men ought to do that's proclaimed. Yes, that's right. But what men ought to do is addressed directly by what God Himself Amen. did. He yeah. did it so yeah. this yeah. this yeah. would take place. That's like that's like what the Jews were doing. That's right. Into the law, so that when the Savior, who was the fulfillment of these there things, came and lived and taught these things. They said, no, 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 we're not, we're, you're, you're blaspheming God by saying that. That's right. Because they thought that they were the end in themselves. That's right. It, the pattern is remarkable. It's all through, it's all through Scripture. This is what God did. Not only did he do it so that it might happen, he announced it. So we know this is the way it was. Yes, Brother Aaron. Jesus told the apostles, I've told you these things before, yeah. so that when it comes to pass, you might know, you'll know that I am he. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and you could put that in front of all kinds of events. <laughs> I know what they He could have said that to Abraham. I've told you these things before. Mm -hmm. he, it could have just happened and not and he not told Abraham before, but him telling mm -hmm. him before, it worked all kinds of things. Not only in yes. Abraham, yes. but in Sarah too, and mm -hmm. in us later. Every generation. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. We're saved by hope, right? Mm -hmm. yep. These affirmations are what stimulate hope. Amen. Unto. Don't be afraid, Abraham. I am your very That's great right. Amen. That's, that's the ultimate of the problem. That's right. Mm -hmm. he, as he whole held on to that, he was saved by hope. Yeah. What God intends is what we're hoping for. Amen. And so he tells us what he did in order that that might come to pass. And that faith will not be disappointed. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now this, uh, this perspective was rarely seen under the law. Only a few prophets and people like this were addressed with this in mind. Under the law, duty was largely perceived as an end of the matter. If you could manage to do what God said, hand clap for you, as a good job. But that is not the end of the matter. That's why Jesus said, if you've done everything you're told to do, say we're still on profitable service. Because God didn't speak just so you would do this or that. He spoke in order that what he had purposed would be brought to fruition or culmination. In Christ, a new manner of speaking has been established. Now, if he gives a commandment, it's not like the old commandment. Is it the new commandment? Now it's just a bit different. Love one another now as I have loved you. See, now it's a different kind of commandment. Completely. Now what does he say? They, he says this is in order to the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glory. Uh, some versions manage to really garble this up. But this I'll give it what some of them say. Here's the uh, Jewish Bible. So that we would bring him praise. Here's the God's word. So that he should be praised. Murdoch says so that he might be glorified. New American Bible says for the praise of his glory. Now all praise to God for what follows the Living Bible, that he might be glorified. 
for the praise of his glory. Now all praise to God for. So that we would praise this glorious, so forth. In high praise of the glory, so we should praise God. This brings praise to God. Let us praise God. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of, the message says, so that we might be in to the praise of the commendation of his glorious grace amplified. I'll tell you the bottom line what this text is saying. This text is not saying so you will praise God. It's so that you yourself will be the praise. Yes. Amen. That's the point of the text. Amen. That we might be like a trophy yeah. uh-huh. that is praised. God is praised because it is trophy. Uh-huh. <laughs> that we might be to the praise. That we might be to the praise. Amen. Of his glory. Good. Yeah. Which, which means that any assembly that isn't pointing to Christ is actually an idolatrous assembly. Well, yes. Yeah, pointing it, rather to, to what they've done rather than what God's it's done. It's promoting, yeah. To be, yeah. It's promoting idolatry. It would be a more accurate way to say it, yes. Yeah. The idea is not that he intended that we should praise him. Mm-hmm. He already had a lot of that going on. That's not the purpose behind this. Mm-hmm. Now, this devastates a lot of doctrine. I'll be right up front with you. Because mm-hmm. this is aggressively taught in our day. That this is what it's all about, that we should praise God. Mm-hmm. And I'm, a, I'm categorically saying that is not what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Amen. Others seeing you will praise God. That's the point. These others being angelic hosts. The idea is that the saints themselves become a cause for praise. See, the fact that you've got to make praise happen shows you that God's purpose has not been brought out. God predestinated us to the adoption of children by himself, unto himself, in order that we might be a trophy for which praise would be pulled out of others when they beheld this, they'd praise God for what He'd done in us. That's right. That somebody else would praise God for what's done in you. That's the point. Like the angelic hosts in Romans. That's Romans right. Four and five. That's exactly when they right. They saw what God had done. They saw what That's Christ had done. They fell on their faces and they pronounced these blessings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now God knew that this would not happen if he didn't do something that caused it would cause this to happen. He had to produce a work that would that would cause this to happen. Versus telling him you'd better praise me. We're not saying don't praise God. We're just saying that's not what this text here is saying. They're an, the saved are an exhibit of a trait that was hitherto veiled. The the grace of God was a fact that was largely veiled prior to Christ. There's a little bit of talk about it, but not much, let me tell you. It was not known. Angelic hosts didn't know anything about it. They had never seen a witness of it. And so God set this plan in motion so that there would be... People could see what grace can do. That's right. Now, now there, people are holding out what the plans and procedures of men can do. And it has certainly not produced praise to God. Anyone with one eye and half sense, as my grandma used to say, knows that it has not produced praise to God. It has produced quite a source of income. But it hasn't produced praise to God. Isn't this taught in the scripture out of Corinthians with the abounding of grace to many will bring or uh, uh, many will bring praise Cause to God. thanksgiving to abound. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's the same thing. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. This deals with the large scope of it. Yes. There's a there, there seems to be from, from the way that scripture presents this an aspect of God and his working that can't be seen any better 
than than how he has he has arranged it with creating mankind in his own image and then in the context of having been fallen and being redeemed back to himself and his working in them. It's like it's seen better in that than any other Amen. presentation of it. Amen. So you can you can see then what a serious matter it is if men want to uh, to make application to this. What a serious matter it is to rebel against being used in that manner and being submitted to God. How that it, it makes your existence so far as any any usefulness vanity. Amen. Amen. To the praise of his of the glory, <clears throat> the glory of his grace. Now there's the glory of God. There's the glory that we'll participate in in the resurrection of the dead. But this is the glory of his grace, the splendor of his grace, the obvious outshining of his grace, so that his grace, all of a sudden people see what grace is by what it has accomplished. Oh, you can only imagine when the, when the whole body of Christ has gathered together and they stand before the throne and their robe is washed white in the blood of the Lamb. And all the cherub and the seraph and the angels behold this. What a shout, what a shout of praise is going to go up for the glory of His grace. Because His grace is going to be, as it says in Zechariah, they'll be crying, Grace, grace unto it. <laughs> That's what will shine. You've got to ask yourself the question. As people today normally think, is it the grace of God that's seen? If it is, they think it's the grace that he didn't destroy them. That's mercy in the first place. That's mercy, not grace. It's, it, grace is, doesn't consist of what it doesn't do. It's what it does do. Mercy is seen and withholding what is the just the desserts that a person <laughs> that what he deserves to get mercy holds it back but grace gives him something <laughs> and our text is saying he gives it because he predestinated that's right. Amen. because he chose yeah. that's why he gives it because of what he did mm -hmm. that's why he does it when you get within the perimeter of salvation and redemption in Christ Jesus, you get inside there, all of a sudden you're in the domain where grace begins to be fulfilled because, it, because his predestination and his choosing has to do with getting inside this, this perimeter where the blessing is realized. The grace, as I mentioned, is not perceived by God overlooking the sinful condition of man. People do, they, I bet they think this way. And sometimes you may be tempted to think this way. Well, at least I didn't get what I deserved. And, and you probably are right in, <laughs> in that. Mm -hmm. But that's not how the grace of God is perceived. You don't, people aren't going to praise God because they didn't go to hell. They're going to praise God because they went to heaven. <laughs> there's a big difference in there. They're not going to praise God because the devil didn't overcome them. They're going to praise God because God brought them there through Christ. Amen. There's a difference in the two. This is perceived in them being, as verse 4 says, in a holy and blameless state. Grace did that. Grace caused them to be in a holy and blameless state. Grace did that because God predestinated these people unto the adopted children of Jesus Christ. And God predestinated them because he chose them in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Now, I don't know how you can get more sure about anything than that. That's what you call surety. Amen. And it's glorious, isn't it? Amen. See, these people that are here... They're trophies of grace because God predestinated them to be adopted because he chose them in Christ Jesus before the world began... This changed these people's appetite. It changed their character. 
They don't think like other people think. Amen. They don't have the same ambitions other people have. They're different. Why? Because God's grace was made known in them because he predestinated them because he chose them in Christ Jesus. <laughs> That's why. So if you get to thinking about why you're different and you keep on the train of thought, it'll take you right back to chosen and predestinated. <laughs> And you know that that isn't because of who you were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Woe be the person just because God did this because he saw what you were going to do. You yeah. know that he purposed in himself. Right. It was the good pleasure of his own will that moved it. Now all of a sudden hope begins to have some muscles, mm -hmm. so to speak, yeah. and confidence yeah. surfaces yeah. in the living God. The Abraham was confident because of what God said to him. This this grace, it, it's a manifestation, a specific manifestation of God's power, an expression of God's power. Mm -hmm. So that it, um, it, it isn't, it isn't just that that God has all the power and authority and coerces or just subdues uh, by fiat. Rather, this is. The power of God as uh, when it when it, it goes forth, it actually is a is a moral in not more than an influence. It it like you were saying, it changes. But it's like the thing that it that it um, what grace touches, it conforms. Well, it, yeah. it enables it. It doesn't. It, it doesn't just confine and restrict and and mold externally, but actually, it it causes those upon whom it works to be made like God. It gives agreement with. It's a. Boy, I'm having trouble with this. It's this is a big thought though. <laughs> uh, that you can see how that God needed to to do something like salvation in order for this expression of his power to be made known. Because yeah. it isn't known in like keeping the angels under chains of darkness against the day of judgment. It's both of them are the power of yeah. God, but the expression of that power, yeah. it, it, has, it has more of a, a moral implication to it. Yeah, Showing amen. the goodness of God, yeah. and what he touches, that even though it was corrupt in itself, because he has touched it with grace, it's actually transformed and made good. Amen. Now here, here's something to see in that confirms what you just said. That the love of God is a working influence. It causes things to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now let me illustrate what I mean. That's what if it's if it's perceived. Paul said, The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me mm -hmm. and gave himself for me. Mm -hmm. Right? That love that he saw compelled him. The love of Christ constrains us. It causes things to happen. It's not just that it covers up, and it, that's not it. Amen. It causes things to happen. Mm -hmm. But God had to work in his way to make it, to, for people to see what, how potent his love is. Mm -hmm. He had to work it in this, in this way. Mm -hmm. He had to make thing that he had to determine who was going to participate, determine what they were going to be if they did participate, and then to make it known in grace. And then it set in motion a procedure that proved what he had said. Right. It, it worked at the person, so they ended up where he said he wanted them to end up. Yeah. Not only did they end up, they wanted it, and they were glad. That's right. Now the moral to part... it and the game. The moral part is the, it, it gives the ability to choose the good and refuse the evil. Uh -huh. Not only the ability, but the earnest desire to do it. Yeah. Yeah. 
the Apostle Paul accounts for his conversion, which was a total 180 change from persecuting the church to edifying the church. The grace of God was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ. Amen. Yes. This is something that couldn't be gained from eating of the tree of uh, the knowledge of God. That's right. That's right. Amen. It be given from God. Amen. Amen. Brother Matthew. Yeah, uh, more about what Sister June said. Uh, uh, in this salvation, uh, rather than just being a raw, overt show of power, uh, uh, it's articulated more fully in the Scripture. And in this text you listed earlier, that who created by, by Christ Jesus all things to the intent that now unto principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And not only is, is it a, a demonstration of his power, but how he used that yeah. power, the yes. wisdom in yeah. which he worked all these things out. Amen. Now, just to, I will just ask you, that's, some of you have seen this, at least a portion of it. It's made an impact on you, hasn't it? When you saw it, it did, did something, didn't you? That's because that's how God's kingdom works. He purposes it. He does it. He, and then he brings you into the area where grace teaches you, and it, that changes you. Amen. And right, he continues the thought. <clears throat> We're in. Mm -hmm. Again, our verse, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein. Some versions read, by which, for where we're in. Or commensurate with, or he favored us with, or in which, or wherewith. And the where it is, grace is what you're in. Grace, wherein. <laughs> you're in grace. So the word wherein is translated from a word that means a place proper. We'd say place proper would be the main place, fundamental place. In the interior of some hole, within the limits of some space, that's Thayer's Greek lexicon, the technical definition of wherein. The primary idea, as Freiburg says, is within, withinness, denoting static position or time, means you don't get out of the area of place, denoting a position within boundaries. Grace is the circle. Mm -hmm. And whatever a person becomes, which is according to God choosing us in Christ Jesus and predestining us to the adoption of sons, grace is the circle in which that is accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Brother Jeremy? No. Oh. This is the true grace of God. Where and you stand. It, grace is the environment, in other words. Grace is the environment in which the stated objective is realized. Now, it's admittedly, this is a technicality, but it's a refreshing one to Amen. think about. The less you actually comprehend the grace of God, the the less apt what God determined is to happen in you. All of us who have grown yeah. can, can attest to yeah. that reality. Amen. We've experienced that. Yeah. Yes. We know that because of our increase, we've become more stable. Amen. Uh, Amen. And, and we now have the capacity for even more. Amen. See, the perimeter of grace is very broad. Yeah. It's not like a little... <laughs> the fact that it is a it is a containment doesn't mean it's a little bitty containment. It's very very large. Yes. Just another thought. Everything about God is superlative. We know that. Yes, but amen. There, yeah. But there are some things in which He <laughs> seems to delight amen. more amen. concerning Himself. Now, it's important that we know that God has all power and that He's righteous and that. You know, um, that he'll not not abide iniquity. You know things things like this. But now you think about the investment he made <coughs> in demonstrating this quality of his character. 
and you see that this is this is something about God that He delights to make known. Yeah. I mean, He yes. He, he he delights to make known. He will rest in His love. Mm -hmm. But He, but it's like He sets it, just like it says, "I've exalted My word above all My name." Mm -hmm. See, there, everything isn't just on a on a horizontal field. The grace of God yeah. is a very it is a very um, well. It's a quality that that God Himself has chosen to exalt. Yeah. And, but but I, I'm saying that because of the investment. Yeah. What else has God revealed about Himself that cost what He paid in order for this to to transpire? Where has a personality of the Godhead had to have been separated? Yeah. Uh, where, between the, the Father and the Son, where has God in any form been humbled and partaken of, of, of anything less than His exalted self? What, uh, this is an eternal effect on God. This is, this is, ever since it's happened, it's never going to be any different. Jesus is never going to become just the Word again. There's a, a big investment in this being made known about God. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. See, one of the principal ingredients of grace is favor. Mm -hmm. In other words, God doesn't do anything out of obligation. Mm -hmm. Well, I promised it. I'm going to... Mm -hmm. I'll do it because I promised it. It isn't like that. It, it has favor. In other words, God is moved to do what He enjoys Amen. or what He prefers mm -hmm. or wh when He favors... Now, you would think after you read about the fall of man that man could never get into that category again of being favored, preferred, so forth. But God in redemption devised a means of getting man into this favor where God wants to do this. The issue now is getting man to want him to do it. See, that's, <laughs> that's what preaching and teaching and all that ultimately is designed to get people to want what God wants to do. Yeah. When they do, mm -hmm. it's on the way. Amen. Grace, as Brother Ricky has already pointed out, is the environment in which we stand. Mm -hmm. The less aware you are of grace, the more liable you are to fall. Mm -hmm. It's the well. Grace is the well from which spiritual gifts are issued comes out of the well of God's grace. It is what enabled Paul to affirm, I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God. See, grace is what, what enabled him to do that. God's called the saints into the grace of Christ who is the administer of the grace. He, he, he is the administrator of the grace. God has called you into the grace of Christ. Galatians 1.6 The grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love. See, that's where all the... Uh, you can't get God to do something He does not want to do. Amen. No matter how much you pray and beg and work, you... This is not the way God is. He does everything according to the counsel of His own will. And grace puts you squarely in the will of God. Amen. Amen. And the more aware of it you are, the more you delight. Mm -hmm. You'll say, well, Jesus, I delight to do Thy will. O oh God. Grace is, there's help in grace. See, it's a very large thing. So grace is seen as something in which we are located, not merely something we receive. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, what the context of this scripture. It's speaking of grace as a location, not a possession. Although let us have grace. I mean that that is a teaching of scripture, but he he's more at the foundational level here. It is glorious. Well, grace will work in us. 
reproduce itself in us as well. That's right. So that we will then extend it to others. That, yes, right. Extend it to us that's right. our measure. Your speech could be with grace. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. I like this point you make here that uh, don't expect to, to get any of the provisions of God outside the grace of God. No. Mm -hmm. and you said here that we uh, the supplies and enablements and uh, and the benefits of salvation are, yeah. are in the grace of God. See, if you could, then you God would be giving you something He didn't want to give. Yeah. Yeah. And this, seven sons of Sceva didn't get any of it. That's or right. Jesus didn't get any of it. Now mm -hmm. there are some who teach this very subtly. They say if you sow, mm -hmm. God has set this law in motion yeah. that you will reap. That's true. Yeah. You don't even have to be your name could be Donald Trump. It doesn't make any difference who you are. This. Yeah. Now, God hasn't set any law in motion that obviates His grace That's right. or that doesn't need His grace. That's a short circuit just like in the garden. That's right. You get this without God. <laughs> Wherein, that grace, He's made us. He's made us accept as our reads. Other versions say, read the different, which He freely bestowed on us, the made part left out has freely given us favored us with he has taken us into his favor he has made us freely accepted he has poured out his grace has poured out upon us gracious love that he gave us and he has enriched us he, what I'm saying is all of those verses miss the point even though it is true that he did give us grace and that's true that, but that's not what he's saying here. Grace is not what we get. Grace is where we are. Yeah, amen. There's a big difference now in the two. It's the location where we are. Mm -hmm. We're in God's grace. That's mm -hmm. what makes us accepted mm -hmm. in the beloved. The words made us are the first part of a single Greek word, which I don't particularly care about about this approach, but this is the truth, which means to make graceful, charming, lovely, agreeable. Grace makes you attractive to God. Amen. Amen. That's the point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. It makes you pleasing mm -hmm. and favorable mm -hmm. to God. Mm -hmm. Not because of what you've done, but because of where you are. Amen. Oh, I tell you, yeah. it's a great truth to see. Israel made a mistake of thinking that they could just... That's it. They, they, didn't, they didn't state it this way, but they thought they could take the grace of God for granted. Yeah, we be slavery. Abraham, see. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. There you are. Do that. We'll show so you. We could just go out and do as they please. Then after they got it, we could just take it and use it however we please. Yeah, this is not the way it is at all. Yeah. This is why God could say, you're the apple of my eye. That's why he can say that. It wasn't because they'd done such wonderful things that they were the apple of his eyes, because he chose them, lavished his love upon them. Yeah, that's what made them the apple of his eye. Amen. This is the language he hath made us. This is the language of creation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the new creation. Mm -hmm. It's a result of God's workmanship Amen. he made us. This is not speaking of what we've received or reiterate, as some versions suggest. It speaks of what we have become Amen. by the grace of God. He that toucheth you touches the apple of my eye. Uh, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Why not? They are precious in my sight. What made them precious in your sight? My grace made them precious. Amen. Amen. Why did they get, why did they were in grace? Because I predestinated them to be adopted as sons, and that's where all the sons are put. Amen. Why did you predestinate them? Because I chose them in Christ before the foundation of the world, in Christ, so it was solid mm -hmm. and had basis and couldn't be contradicted. Mm -hmm. So don't touch my people. Mm -hmm. Amen. Don't do it. If, you, if they're needy and you don't help them, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. See, that's why this Matthew 25, Brother Michael's been teaching yeah. us, that's why it's true. He made us accepted. Mm -hmm. Once again, 
this point, I, I, they don't, people, the translators apparently didn't see it very clearly. Other versions say he's favored us. All right, that's, I, I can see that. Taken us into his favor, has blessed us, made us freely accepted in the favor which he has shown us. In other words, when you come to God, whether it's it, it initially coming to God or whether you are coming to him and you, Jesus intercedes for you, it's got to be because you're already accepted. Amen. You can't come to God to get accepted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got to come to the Son yes. to get accepted. Amen. Amen. There's a technicality, but this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. All the Father giveth me mm -hmm. shall come to me. What do you do with them, Jesus? I'll put them over here in grace. Amen. Well, they will be precious in the sight of God. Uh -huh. And rare in this circumference of grace, all the resources are right there. Yeah. All right there in grace. Mm -hmm. God could not receive us in Adam. That's right. mm -hmm. There had to be another way. Not even his matchless grace could induce such an acceptance. The bestowment of grace upon us is certainly something that takes place. We keep, this is true. However, before grace could bless us with all spiritual blessings, we had to be changed. Amen. We had to be made new or made accepted. God had to make us accepted. Give us favor. Make us attractive to his eye. His eye who sees every flaw and imperfection. His eye that cannot excuse sin. Huh? That's the eye we're talking about. His eye to whom everything is open and naked. Mm -hmm. That eye looks at a person in grace and God likes what he sees. Mm -hmm. Because he will not save anybody he doesn't want to save. Right. <laughs> he made us accepted. Made us accepted. So grace is an environment in which men are made acceptable to God. And as they stand in that grace, they are pleasing God. Now he, he ties it up even tighter than this. He has made us accepted in the beloved. Other versions read, in the one he loves. That's big capital O. Uh -huh. In the loved one. Mm -hmm. That's Jesus. In the beloved one. In his blessed, in his beloved son, his dear son. Mm -hmm. Christ. God loves him. Yeah. By the one being loved. He gave us to his dear son. And the one having been loved. That is that the love is before he came to earth, he loved, Father loved him. So see how technical this is. God chooses us in Christ before the foundation of the world. God predestines us into the adoption of sons. God puts us in grace, but he does so by giving us to Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> and he administers the grace through Christ. Yeah, Even though grace is, a, is an environment we're in, mm -hmm. you, you can't just like pick it up all around you. It's, it's given to you mm -hmm. by Christ. He's the administrator of it. And that circumstance is what makes you acceptable to God. Amen. Not what you've done, not what you want to do, what you are and where you are in Christ. He receives you for Jesus' sake. Uh -huh. Amen. Take Jesus out of that, yeah. and you have no access to grace at all. Uh -huh. Not at all. He's made us accepted in the beloved. All right. What if an individual chooses not to nurture that identity with Christ? Hmm? What if they choose not to follow Christ, not to pick up their cross every day and follow Christ? What if they elect, so to speak, not to do that? They're outside the perimeter of grace. That's right, 
There's no way a person like that can be saved. They just can't. That's all there is to it. It has to be in Christ, and Christ is in the environment of grace that you have Christ. Because he's the ultimate one God loves. But again, if you want to narrow God's love down to his foundation, he really loves Christ. That's the one he really loves. That's his greatest of his well-beloved son. He's unique. You take Jesus out of the scenario, and it's vain to talk about God loving anybody. God loves righteousness. And really, why should he love men outside of Christ? That's right. He couldn't. It's just an imagination. See, that's That's why it's all based on his choice, on his predestination. To adopt them as sons. And then he puts them where he can bless them. Where they can receive. Where they can be changed. Where they can be altered. It's it's ingenious. Only God could do something like this. And he has done it. Two times God affirmed audibly from heaven. This is my beloved son. This is the son I love. Right here. Everything else, every other person who's loved, who I love, is because of this one here. Amen. That's why. God's, yes. No, go ahead. Now, I can see how God could love men if they were like him. That's right. You know, you know if, if, oh, I, yes, if amen. men can become like him, and that's of course right. this is done through Jesus Christ, then he can love them. Conform to the image right. of his son. See, amen. that's why the purpose includes this ultimate conformation. Uh-huh. There'll be no question about it then. There'll be nothing in them that he doesn't. That's right. Now there's things he, he can't receive. Mm-hmm. Anything from Adam. He has to, the aim that he purposed before the foundation of the world They'd be perfectly conformed to Christ, which means his love will be absolute, without variation and without any danger of being removed. (laughs) He makes us lovable, ultimately in Christ Jesus. Now, it's evident that God's love of a person is contingent upon their view of Christ. Now, Jesus said this, to his disciples. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand to make so that they make sure they know. The Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that he himself doeth and will show him greater things than these that ye may marvel. See, just so that you know that you're not talking about the love of God, you've got to start talking a lot more about Jesus than about you. You got to talk more about Jesus than about people, because the love is focused on Jesus. Amen. Thou hast sent me and hast loved them. It's the ones made perfect in one that He prayed about. Thou hast loved me. Now Jesus looks at His disciples on the night of His betrayal. He says, "The Father Himself loveth you, because." Huh? Because right. mm-hmm. ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. Mm-hmm. That you couldn't be any plainer. That's right. They knew he did because they were there. That's right. They were at the table. Mm-hmm. Jesus again affirmed this in his, that night to earlier to his disciples. Mm-hmm. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, that is, retains them, mm-hmm. he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. It is again. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Again, he said, if a man love me, he'll keep my words and my Father will love him. See? His conditions, are, it's got to be within this framework of choosing predestination and in the grace. It's got to be in that framework. It's a vivid depiction of divine acceptance. Now Paul starts out this epistle with solid bedrock teaching about why the Ephesians are acceptable. 
did, he's going to tell them what to do. Yeah. And as difficult as he's going to tell them to keep the unity of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. He's going to tell them to put on the whole armor of God. <laughs> he's, going to get, he's, going to, he's going to give them things to do. Uh -huh. But it's all going to be doable. Once they see if God be for us, who could be against Amen. us? But you have to be in this yeah. circle of grace. Which meant you were predestinated to the adoption of sons. Which means he chose you in Christ for the foundation of the world. And if you get to thinking too much of yourself, remember it's in the beloved. Right. <laughs> so it's all tied up and calculated to produce praise to God. When the whole thing is seen in picture and vividly, there's going to be a, vault, a shout of praise that has never been heard on that scale before because they're going to see God did it, God did it, God did it. Yeah. From beginning to the end, salvation is of the Lord. He's teaching them so that will not surprise them on that day. Amen. All right, brethren, any of you have something you'd like to add? <laughs> this pretty much uh, closed the case about God's love. If a man loved me, yeah. my father will love him. Isn't that yeah, good? That's right. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Convenient. That's the king clear. speaking there. Yeah, that's huh? right. My father will love him. Mm -hmm. So don't sitting around and say, does the father love me? Get the work on what he said. Yes, amen. Now you know why we do, we do our best to emphasize Christ. Yes, yes, yes Brother Jeremy. This point you brought out that um, this is the work that God's doing. So we know this is what God wants. Yeah. It's the, the preaching and teaching is to get the people to see that this is... For for them to to focus on God and get the, their want to want this. Amen. Cause it, so anyway, I just thought, I thought that was uh, really good to see that that this is what preaching and teaching does is just shows men this is already this is already what God wants. Mm -hmm. Let's get us to want it. Amen. Amen. Yes, brother Ricky. What you said about grace being an environment has really opened up some good things. <laughs> In my own consideration, I thought of Peter's exhortation. He said, "Grow in grace." Grow in grace. You know, there you are. Knowledge of our Lord <laughs> Savior, Jesus the exhortation isn't just increase in knowledge. The exhortation is increased through knowledge. Through that knowledge, that amen. Is, that is in the environment where the knowledge of Christ is preeminent in your heart and mind. You grow. Yeah. Now we talk about habitat in the world. Every kind of animal has its habitat. Yeah. Uh, warm animals, their habitats in warm water. We have animals that can that can stand cold water. We have animals that that thrive on land, animals that thrive in water, animals that thrive in air. But if you take them out of their habitat, yeah, that's they right. can't sustain life. They grow yeah, right. and flourish in the habitat God designed them for because they yeah. personally yeah, yeah. are fashioned and made mm -hmm. to prosper in that environment. Uh -huh. Now the new creature has a new heart, has yeah. faith, has yeah. understanding. He's been given everything he needs for life and godliness. Yeah. But see, all those resources are in that Amen. habitat. Amen. So what Amen. Said at the beginning Amen. is perfectly suited for this entire lesson because mm -hmm. it's as we are able to associate everything we do with the work of God and salvation, that's where the environment of grace is. Amen. We were recreated to live in grace. Amen. 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 Environment of activity that takes That's place. That's good. In the environment That's good. Of grace. Uh -huh. That's good. Because faith is not a one time event either. Faith is not just a thing. No, it it's isn't. It advances right. also. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Now, once you see that grace is a domain where we're accepted by God, then our own efforts to be played, you see how useless. Yeah. and how irrelevant that is. That's right. When you see, uh, grace now, now, when a, per, when a, a church environment in which grace is rarely mentioned, see, they don't know where they've been placed. If they're in Christ, they don't know where they are. Yeah. They lost their bearings. So they're like the Israelites who wandered in the wilderness. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. You see, ultimately, God cannot deny himself. Yeah. yeah. And so if he's working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure... Then in the end, you'll hear, well done. And you he, can make hit you like him. That's right. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you have to say, well, he'll do it for himself. You know, yeah, and, and, right. and, and, and you may have to remind you, say it like that. 
You know, well, he's faithful. Well, I've been made willing in the day of my of his power. That's right. See, well, I wanted to do this. Well, you were made willing in the day of his power. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I really am enjoying this higher view, this higher perspective of the love of God, because you know, just someone saying, "Well, I just know God loves me. And that's that's all I know." It makes it see, it shows you that it's so shallow. And ignorant, because you see all these things being brought yeah. up of just the love of God, and so I'm, I'm really thankful for you expounding the perspective Amen. you have on that, the truth in it. Yeah. Love, love is a facet of grace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's how big grace is. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for your grace for your choice, for your predestination, for your objective in Christ Jesus. We thank you that salvation is so sure in Christ. We ask, the Lord, that you would assist us in capitalizing on Christ and seeing him in every single aspect of this great salvation. It's in his name we pray. Amen.